Hi, thanks for coming. My name is Mark. Uh, I work at a company in Houston called iOffice, and we're going to go on a whirlwind tour of the functional programming ecosystem in Scala. We're using um, a small little Twilio application that we have deployed in production at iOffice as a kind of a basis for looking at the different things that we're going to look at. Um, so iOffice is a facility management software platform. Um, we, any big companies um, who have massive buildings, lots of buildings, they'll use us to manage their floors, their inventory, where people sit. And that's kind of the traditional workplace management offering. And then where we're different is we'll layer on top of that a number of mobile applications for the employee experience. So um, this lends itself to a kind of service-oriented architecture. Um, and we have, over the last five years, migrated from a Java monolith to um, service-oriented architecture that's probably 80% Scala. And over the last two years, we started the journey from using Scala as a better Java to the more pure functional Scala. Um, can I get a hands up of who here um, has used Scala before? Okay, great. And uh, who uses it at work? Great. Who uses pure FP at work? Okay, great. So you guys um, will probably know a lot about what I'm talking about. It's for the people who probably haven't, um, I should ask, who's doing pure FP in their own time with Scala? Okay. So if you didn't put your hands up at all, um, we're going to hope to show you why you might want to uh, use pure FP with Scala and how you would go about starting that and designing an application um, with that goal in mind. Um, a few thanks in, in advance. Um, this book by Sam Halliday um, is the book that made a lot of this click for me. I watched a lot of Monad tutorials um, and a lot of different functional programming talks, but couldn't really picture in my mind how you would design an application from scratch um, with these methodologies. Um, and this book really put it together for me. And then uh, to pull out of Rob Norris, who wrote Doobie, um, he's been very helpful online, and he gives this talk, which will give you the Monad tutorial I'm not going to give you in this talk, if you want it. Um, and he's also let me use some of the slides at the start. And then thanks to Scala Z and CIO Gitters and HTTP4S. So hands up who thinks they have a fairly good graph on referential transparency. Okay, so um, referential transparency is at the core of what we try to do when we try to do pure functional programming. Um, I should say that the reasons we want to do this type of programming is that well, number one, it can help us eliminate entire classes of bugs from making it to production. Um, and I also think that it helps us push tertiary complexity of our problems to the outside of our apps. And this lets us see the inherent complexity of our business domain and can um, make problems in our assumptions on our business domain stand out a lot clearer than when we have all the complexities uh, intermingled, which you might have in your typical imperative app. So um, the question is, we can go through these slides fairly quickly. Um, do we think that these two programs are the same, a tuple of AA and a tuple of an expression and expression? Are they the same? OK, it depends. Are these two programs the same? A equals 42, tuple AA, 42, 42. Do they have the same meaning? They do. I see a few heads nodding. Um, this one, print line, hi, AA, print line, print line, same program? Nope, not. Iterator, AA, iterator.next, iterator.next, okay, no. Nope. And an array, one, two, three, AA, array, one, two, three, array, one, two, three. Is that the same? No, nope. someone's saying no. Nope. Okay, and it depends. In an array, it's going to depend. Uh, usually on what the contents of the array are. So in this case, it probably is referentially transparent. Um, so now we're going to skip real quickly our referential transparency. Yeah, go ahead. So the, uh, the two different, uh, uh, the array is the array. Yeah. mutable. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't have a 
a good answer for you. I can think about it further. <laughs> I can talk to you after. Uh, so referential transparency is a syntactic or a semantic property of programs. Something is either referentially transparent or it's not. Um, and if it's not, you would call it a side effect in functional programming. Um, so we're going to talk about how we can turn those side effects into effects that we can pass around as if they were values. Um, so here is an example of an effect. Um, it, the effect would be the effect of nullability or absence. So we have an option which takes some type of A, and we, it is a option itself is a sum type which can be a none or a sum of A. Um, and what you want to focus on is this type parameter here. This is going to become important. Um, either is similar to option, but kind of the opposite of it in that it is it can be something and something else. So instead of being, um, or sorry, the opposite to a sum product, it can be something and something else instead of something or something else. So here we have two type parameters, and then in Scala, case class left and case class right are the two instances of an either that you can have. So you can have an A here or a B. Um, a reader is another type of effect, and it is the effect of if you give it some E, it will be able to give you back an A. So this can be used um, for providing configuration to a chain of computation. So what do they have in common? Well, they all compute an answer, but they also encapsulate something else about the computation. And this is what we call an effect, but it's pretty vague. So can we be more precise? And to be more precise, we can say that these all have the shape of some type F that's going to take another type for it to become a fully defined type. So option A is of this shape F of A, either EA is of this shape if you give it an E already. So you can turn something from, that needs two types to be filled into something that just needs one by uh, providing the first type. And same for reader. You can make it this shape if you provide some type E. Does anyone have any questions on that so far? Yeah, go ahead. Is shape just like a context or like that? It looks like an F of A. Or is the shape actually an official like? Um, I I think the proper term will probably be kind. Okay. So um, the kind of option is star, which means it takes one other type. Um, where the kind of this is um, star star to star, um, and we're turning it into a star to star mode, providing the first type. So kind is, I think, the proper term. I'm going to say shape. Though. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, okay, so yeah, F in this case is the effect. So we want an A and there are effects that are going to happen to give me that A. So you would normally get the Monad tutorial after this amount of slides. We're going to skip that and we're going to go to application design to see how we can use this on a day-to-day -day basis. Our application is going to be um, a simple service that takes a HTTP request and uses the Twilio API to send a text message. So we have our application. And these, we want to talk to the internet or listen to the internet. We're going to need a database for something. And this is Twilio in the cloud that's going to actually do the work. So what we want to do is listen for a message to send a text. We, when we are ready, we want to really use Twilio to send the real text message. And how the Twilio API works is you buy phone numbers from them and use those phone numbers to send text messages. And we're going to store the phone numbers that we've bought in a database. So we need to be able to get the number back from the database, and we need to be able to save new numbers to the database. Um, and actually, these two slides, these should not be separate slides. So we also need to be able to buy a number from Twilio. Now, one of the things that really helped me was realizing that these arrows are the effects that your application, or the input-output effects, at least, that your application needs to do. So if we can find a way to um, codify these five different arrows and turn them, put them, use the RF shape, we can possibly abstract over the fact that these actions require real world interactions. So we're going to talk about that. The first library that we're going to talk about is um, Scala-Z. Um, an alternative in Scala world would be CATS. 
They both provide some foundational type classes like functor and monad, and also um, a large number of data structures that remove the escape patches, the data structures that come in the Scala standard live provide you. So these data structures constrain you more into the pure subset of Scala that we are gonna to try to keep using. Um, and I'll show you what we're gonna use this for in a moment. Um, but how we turn these arrows into effects that we can abstract over is we're going to use traits. So in Sam's book, he calls these traits algebras. We're gonna just call them interfaces, okay? So if you're familiar with uh, Java or anything else, um, this trait can just be thought of as an interface. We know something about this trait, and that is that we we're gonna need to provide some effects to get any of these answers. So we're gonna put the shape of our effect in here. So we're saying we need some F, and it needs to be something that's gonna take another um, type parameter, but we don't know what F is gonna be yet. And then we're gonna turn our arrows, so get available and save phone number into functions that return an F of some result. And save is also gonna turn back, uh, return this number that you saved to the database. Any questions on this so far? Okay, great. And then our second trait is gonna be called Twilio. This is gonna be for talking to the, to the actual real Twilio service. Again, we've defined the effect that we, uh, or we've abstracted over the effect with this F. We're gonna send this SMS, which is gonna take a Twilio number, take a Twilio SMS, and it's just gonna send it. And we're gonna return unit because it's kind of a fire and forget uh, operation. And then we have some other helper methods down here, two Twilio message, which is gonna take a validated text message, which is something that has real phone numbers in it, and turn it into something that Twilio understands. We're gonna use Twilio to validate our phone numbers, and we're gonna be able to buy a, a number from Twilio. So after our interfaces, this is the things we need to do with the outside world. Next, we have our business logic, or um, what you might hear talked about as modules. A module is something that can depend on other modules or algebras. And because other modules are pure and algebras are pure, this module itself will be pure, unless you go crazy and do something stupid in here. But as long as you follow the um, conventions, yeah, you can assume that modules are pure structures of business logic. So this phone numbers module, we still don't know what F is gonna be, so we're just gonna abstract over here, and we're gonna say that we need some instance of our phone numbers repository for this F, and we need some instance of our Twilio interface for this F. So nothing has changed here except we've linked these two Fs together, so when, it, when we finally decide on what F this is gonna be, we know that for this case, it has to be the same F. Um, I'm gonna skip this for one second, but I'm gonna come back to it, and now, I have access to all of the functions that we just defined in that trait. So I need a phone number, so I'm gonna ask the phone number's repository for it. It might give me back a number. If it doesn't, or if it does, I'm um, going to do this thing here, which I'll explain in a second, or else I'm going to use Twilio to buy a new number, and then I'm gonna save that number into the database, and then I'm gonna return the phone number. Any questions on that so far? I'm about to explain the four comprehension. So, all of these functions or methods return an F of something else. And so far, F is nothing. So we can't really do anything with it. In Scala, we like this for yield comprehension. We like this syntax for doing things. So we wanna be able to use our functions in this for yield syntax. And to be able to do that, they need to have a map, and a f whatever they return needs to have a map and a flat map me method. And these all need to return the same thing that has a map and a flat map method. So to give our F a map and a flat map method so that we can use it in this style, we're gonna add one more constraint to our module, which is that whatever F you use here, eventually it has to be a monad. Does anyone have any questions on that? All right, good. Um, we also, sorry for this slide, it was hard to get it all presentable, but we also have a second module which is for texts. Um, and so again, it depends on Twilio and it depends on our phone numbers trait. Our F will also be a monad and it's got um, 
a little help helper method here that's going to take a text message uh, from and a two number and make sure that these are valid phone numbers. Um, and or sorry, it's going to take these and turn it into a validated text message, not a validated phone number. And then up here is the actual sending of the text message. So it takes in an unvalidated text message, um, uses the phone numbers repository to get a Twilio number, um, validates the number we're sending it to so that we, we're not just going to um, get an error from Twilio. And then turns it in, uses this to turn it into a text message that can actually be sent and then uses our, tech, our Twilio repository to actually send the text message. So what do we have right now? We have quite an accurate idea of what our application actually needs to do. So at this point, we can forget about databases and we can forget about uh, Twilio and we can just make sh try and make sure that our business logic does what we think it does. And this is one of the advantages of abstracting over our effect like this, because we can plug anything that has this shape into this hole. And this can really help us with our testing. Um, so there's a thing called a state monad. And this is something that Scala Z will provide or CATS will provide. And it has the shape, uh, it has two type holes, right? Um, and the first one, it lets you operate over some state, return the answer, and return the new state. So this is going to be our state, and this is going to be some answer we compute later. So to make state look like an, F, an, an FA, we need to parameterize it with one type already. And that type is going to be a case class called world. World is going to represent our database. So our database is basically a list of phone numbers. So that's what this case class is going to represent. It's going to re represent a list of Twilio phone numbers. Um, and with this type, we can now implement our phone number repository uh, where F is a state of world and A. Any questions on that? Yep. An I list. Um, this is a list that comes from Scala Z that has the exception throwing methods of list removed. So if there's no head on this, um, you have to use head option. And there's probably other ones, but the main one I notice is there's no head on it. Um, okay, so we're, this is a little bit confusing because of how the imports are happening, but this F is no longer um, nothing. It's this F up here. So it's, this F is now a state of world and A. And um, Scala Z is also going to give me some helper methods to, to work with state. So I'm going to say this now has to return an F, which is a world of A and a Twilio number. So I'm going to get and I'm going to map, which um, basically means when I call this get available, I can chain many calls of that return states together, but they won't actually do anything until I feed in, until I call run on them and I feed in um, the initial world state. I'm going to show you how to do that in a second. But we're going to map over the state. We're going to take in the world. We're going to um, use the world to find if we have any phone numbers that are not in use. And if, they, um, if there aren't any there, we're going to return them. This should actually be an option from a uh, Twilio number. So we implement our phone numbers repository in this style. We're not, uh, if you want to know more about this in detail, you can talk to me after. Um, and then we're going to import it, our two implementations of Twilio and phone numbers into our test. And this lets us write our tests like this. So we have an initial world, and it's just an empty list. And um, we have a number that we expect Twilio to create for us. And we have an expected world after the operation. So our test. Um, we're going to call phone numbers get Twilio number dot run, and we're going to pass in our initial world. That's what this is what we're passing in here. When we pass in our initial world, we will get back a new world and a phone number. The phone number we're expecting is this, and the state of the new world that we're so in the real world, we would expect the database to have one new row. In our test case, we expect the iList to have one new number in it. So our assertions can be new world should be expected world, phone number should be expected number. And this has been able to test our business logic um, 
to a, um, a high level of granularity without having to worry about databases, internet calls, complicated mocking libraries, any of that sort of thing. And really, all you've had to understand so far is um, an F with a type hole and turning that F with a type hole into a state uh, with one more type hole. Any questions about testing? Yep. When you're in, when you're implementing your um, traits, yes. um, you can make a mistake. Yep. Um, but um, yeah. But I would possibly argue that it's harder to make a mistake implementing your traits in this method than implementing them with a bunch of injected mock. Uh, objects, um, so you're not. No, it's definitely not. Per, it's not going to make you perfect for sure. You have to be um, careful when you're implementing those things. Uh, any other questions on testing yet? So right now we're testing the happy path. You can test the uh, error path. Um, which I'm not going to show you, but I am going to show you error handling in the main app in a little bit, and you might see that um, how you would translate that into that, and if not, we can talk about it after. Um, okay, so how am I doing for time? So we need something to put into that ZIO or into that um, type hole, and what we're or that F shape, and what we're going to use is ZIO. There's lots of talks on ZIO these last few days. There's one that's going to go into it in a lot of detail right after this, I think. Um, but basically, it's an IO monad that is performant, type safe, concurrent, asynchronous, resource safe, functional. Um, I'm going to use this in a very naive way to show you the concepts. There's lots of opportunities to learn about ZIO in depth while you're here, but this isn't going to be it. But basically, um, what we want to do is ZIO is going to give you some helpers. It's going to give you this app which makes, uh, lets us turn our main object into an object that will accept an IO of exception and unit instead of just unit. Um, so here you can see it also gives you some console helper functions. So you can put string line, get string line, put string line. When you compose these things together, what's, it's important to realize that you're not actually doing anything. Um, until this I.O. that you're returning gets run. So you're composing your program together, not running it. And what's going to run it is a runtime system that's provided by app in the background that you don't have to worry about. So as long as you can return an I.O. Um, by extending app, your Scala app knows how to run it and do everything that you want it to do. Um, this is an example where you don't use app. you uh, provide your runtime system manually. Um, but on, this is what app is doing behind the scenes for you. It's going to call unsafe run and put your program into it. So that's the basics of that. But how do we use it uh, in our application? So we want to implement our Twilio uh, trait uh, so that our F is now an IO. What's a little bit confusing with ZIO is it gives you many type aliases to kind of match it up to existing um, and more maybe currently more widely used IO monads. So this task, um, ZIO has three type parameters um, or E and A. This task lets you not worry about the or and the E. It defines a, uh, or to any E to throwable and that leaves you with a type that has one type hole which is what we're looking for which is the F of underscore. So Instead of F up here, we're, sit, we're now hard coding it to be a task, which is an IO monad of throwable and A. So the Twilio SDK is a really nice Java SDK, but like anything in Java, it can just do whatever it wants whenever it wants. So to try and get a grip of those exceptions or null pointer exceptions that could be thrown for, even though I think I'm using this as it's documented. 
um, which is create a message, pass it in a to number and a from number and a body, and then hit create. When you call create, that's gonna actually do a network request to Twilio and try and send a text message. So to try and wrap all this up and make it referentially transparent, I'm first just gonna use um, Scala's try, which is gonna catch any exceptions that this body throws. And then ZIO gives you just a nice little helper to lift a try into a ZIO called from try. So now this is all nice and lazy. I can treat the result of this function as a value, pass it around, substitute it in different places as if it was referentially transparent because nothing is going to actually go out across the network until I pass this to the unsafe run method with a runtime system at the very end of my program. Is there any questions about what I've done here? Yep. So the, um, from this try into this try, um, if try contains an exception, task will now fail with that exception. So it's, it treats the exception as a value instead of something that gets thrown to the edge of the world. Um, and this task will now carry, will halt any further uh, process, uh, any next steps in the chain and the exception will propagate up. Um, well, actually, it'll just fail, and I'm gonna show you how you handle that. But this basically turns the IO into a failure if it has an exception. Um, and this is the same thing for the other two helper methods that the trait needs to implement, but we can go on. So we also need to talk to a database. Um, Probably the best option for that in Scala when you're doing FP is Doobie by Rob Norris, which I talked about a little bit at the start. Um, it's not an ORM, so if you come from an ORM world, it's not gonna do as much for you as uh, Hibernate or something tries to do, or even Slick. But what it does do is it gives you a way to write queries that have typed returns, uh, return values on them. This doesn't get type checked though. Um, the library provides you a way to check that your SQL is, var is valid, but it's not gonna happen at um, compile time. So you do have to write, be aware of uh, writing valid SQL in between these two quotes. But you can tell it what return type is gonna happen, uh, it's gonna provide, and then there's a number of these um, helpers that say whether it has to be unique or can be a list or um, it's optional or if you don't have this here and it doesn't find a country, it's gonna um, throw an error. And what this gives you is a connection IO. And a connection IO is something that can be later given a connection to a database and run and it will return something, an F with your result. And what's nice about Doobie is that they have, abs like we're abstracting over our F, Doobie has abstracted over the F as well and lets you bring your own. So in our case, we're gonna bring ZIO and when you have a connection IO and you call transact on it and pass in a transactor, which is this thing here, the transactor is what um, carries around the type of IO you want. And this means that the result of this unsafe run is going, or the result of this is going to be an IO of an option of a country. So it's turning a connection IO, which has the potential to be run on a database into something that runs on a database and returns the monad type that I want. And then eventually, and it's all lazy, and then later on when the IO of option country gets passed to the runtime system, that's when the actual work happens. Um, any questions on that so far? What is the type restriction on the IO? Um, it needs to be a cat's effect or sync, I think. Does that answer your question? Um, so here's how we're gonna use Doobie. We're not implementing our trade yet. We're just gonna set up the queries that we want to use. Um, so we have an insert, we have a find by Twilio number, and we have a get any single not in use. And these are just standard SQL wrapped in this little SQL macro. Um, and we're saying that it's a query that will return a, a Twilio number, an optional Twilio number. Uh, same here, 
and this is an update. So to use these things to implement our trait, we have phone numbers Doobie, extends phone numbers repository, and again, we're using our task here. Um, we're importing the object we just created with our, um, with our queries, and we are going to use them and provide them with a transactor. Um, I actually don't have the transactor to show you, but it looks exactly like this, just with task here instead. Um, and again, because these connection IOs that are being returned here, because they are also monads, we can compose them in four comprehensions uh, like we can any other monad. So this is two queries uh, composed together, so they'll only be run, uh, they'll, when it hits the database, they'll be run with one query instead of two. So you save a little time there. Um, okay, any questions? Yep. And this one, um, it's actually been Im uh, imported up here. So it's there somewhere else I'm building a transactor that I'm not showing you, but I'm building it um, exactly like this. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, okay, so the other effect that we need to get a grip on is talking, listening and talking to the internet. And for that, um, a really good option is HTTP 4S. And it gives you a nice uh, DSL for building up HTTP routes, and it can be quite straightforward. Um, you're do, passing in a partial function where each thing that it handles is an endpoint. So in this case, a get to root slash hello will return, um, okay, hello, better world. Um, and then it gives you some, again, it also abstracts over the effect. So you can provide your own IO monad that you want to work with um, instead, which, and the benefit of that is because these, all these libraries are abstracting over the effect type, when we provide it, we can compose our different effects together as if they weren't all different things. So we can compose um, a database request with a um, call to Twilio um, with a response to a HTTP request in a four comprehension and they all play nicely together instead of having to come out of one context and into the next context and carry all that extra load with us. Um, so here's our HTTP service. So if we extend HTTP for SDSL, um, we get um, all of the, we get access to this get and this root and all this nice um, HTTP DSL. It provides, we still haven't decided what our F is going to be, so this is all still totally generic inside here. But what uh, HTTP4S expects is that the result of the body of these functions will be some F and a result. Uh, but we don't know what that F is going to be yet. So we have two endpoints, so a health check endpoint and a endpoint that accepts a request, um, or sorry, accepts a post request and actually will try and send a text message. We get, as long as we use case classes for our um, data transfer objects that we accept and receive, we are gonna get uh, JSON decoding for free by using um, a helper library um, uh, that HTTP4S provides and uses Cersei to generically derive our uh, case class encoders and decoders. So that's what we're doing here. And again, this happens in the context of F as well, which is why we're able to use it in this for comprehension. Um, then we're gonna use our texts module to send a text message. And this is where we talk about error handling. I'm gonna come back to that. And then as long as it makes it down here, we're just gonna say, okay, it must have been sent. Because remember, this just returns a unit. Um, so we're not gonna wait for Twilio to let us know that um, it succeeded. Um, we're going to carry on and um, tell the person that it was sent. And we would do that because we can, handle, we can handle our errors smartly here. Once you have your HTTP service in HTTP4S to turn it into an actual server, you um, are going to pass it into what they call a builder. And there's many different builders. Uh, Blaze is their, um, their own... Um, implementation of a HTTP server using NIO, but you can, if you already have uh, Tomcat 
or one of the other popular Java HTTP servers, they have builders for those also. So once you, you want to mount your service into this server, set some settings, and then um, pass in your service with its dependencies, which is a text module. Um, and up here I'm saying, when I call this, everything is still generic, except it has to be in effect. So I'm going a little bit more constrained on my F here by saying it can be any F as long as it is in effect. This effect comes from cats, uh, cats effect. And is, so you don't get it with the Scala Z or ZIO library when you import these. Um, you, this would be an extra dependency, and that's because um, under the hood, HTTP4S doesn't know about ZIO. It knows about cat's effect. ZIO has a nice property of being able to pretend that it's a cat's effect. Um, but here, this, is, uh, this effect type class is coming from cat's effect. Um, and we get some nice interop as a result. All right, any questions on the HTTP part? All right, so we're also going to want to add login. All these libraries have a theme. They all abstract over the effect type. So we now want to add login into our nice four comprehensions. How are we going to do that? We have log for cats and log for Scala Z, um, which are going to give us that opportunity. So when we import Chris Davenport's log for cats logger, we want to say, we want to decorate that F with the ability to log things. So where we've said before that it's an effect, we're also now going to say it also has to be a logger of some sort. And this logger uh, comes from this library, but we don't know uh, the implementation of the logger. We just know the functionality we want to use from it. So um, to use it, we would say, we have a logger of F dot debug um, pass in whatever we want to log out. And this is just a little nice because these these log statements are going to happen at the right time um, in our uh, program execution. If we just did um, underscore equals print lines in here, um, there are chances that we would think something has happened when it really hasn't. Um, so these um, will get handled by the runtime system and logged appropriately at the right time. Um, some more examples of using login. What I want to, okay. So is there any questions about login before I get onto error handling? No? Okay. So error handling is going to seem a little bit different because when you define your F as a monad, it doesn't actually have a way to recover from errors. If a part of that um, execution fails, it's going to trickle up to the top and it's just going to be a failed program. To get the behavior of um, error handling on a monad, you need to use another type class called monad error. And monad error um, gives you, um, what's it called? Yeah, one well, it gives you many, but the one we're going to talk about function on our F called recover. And this function expects to be given a partial function from, of throwable to unit. So we need to provide an error handler that we can give our now monad error monad. Does that make sense to everyone so far? our implementation of this partial function can do whatever we want it to do. So in this case, I'm going to send it to Raygun. I'm going to um, check out what the exception is and probably send it to Raygun and then carry on with the rest of my program. So this is the important part, partial function throwable to unit, because this is what um, the m function recover expects to be passed in. How you implement your um, recovering method is up to you. In this case, I'm sending to Raygun. Yeah? Uh, can ZIO, uh, ZIO has some log which you might have some tools for the ZIO or is this a monad? Um, so ZIO has a monad error instance. Okay. So when we eventually tell, um, let's use this one, tell HTTP4S that our F is, is, is a ZIO task, 
it will bring in its implicits, one of which is evidence that it is a monad error also. So that means I have access to the recover and ZIO has implemented recover how it wants to implement recover. Now, recover is not the best thing to use here because we might not have sent a text message um, and we're still going to return okay sent. So what this is doing is it's turning your failed, uh, your, your failed computation into a successful one. There is, um, but it's going to return the same response. There is another method that I can't remember off the top of my head that lets you change the, um, the subsequent program. So I could change the, um, I think it's like recover or else. Uh, recover with, okay, yeah. So I would say recover and then the next argument over here would be um, bad JSON or bad request yeah, or something. So, um, oh, there's side effects in here. Um, or oh, sorry, in here. Um, yep. So, as far as, that's a good point, but as far as I know, that's okay because it's going to be happening uh, in the runtime system and recovering returns an IO of a thing. So this, what I'm passing in is going to happen inside the context of a ZIO eventually. Um, but if I'm wrong about that, someone let me know. Um, Okay, you have any more questions about error handling? All right. So let's check our time. Okay, let's skip configuration, but you can assume I'm gonna say a lot of the same things about pure config. It gives you a way to load conf without having to worry about your F or to, you can provide your own F. So now, yep. Um, it's out on its own, but I believe it relies on cats. So it's, it's not in the cats ecosystem, I don't think, uh, officially at least. Um, so now we want to wire up our application. And this looks a little bit messy, but what I want to focus on down here is this is our main method. Um, it's called stream because one thing I didn't explain was that when you run your HTTP server, it's going to return a stream in, of IOs instead of an IO itself. Um, but luckily, it understands what a task is, so you're able to put task in here. So this is a stream of a task to an exit code. We want to build up our HTTP server. What that needs is a, um, a text implementation. So this is our text module is a dependency of our HTTP service. So we're going to pass that in. To construct a text um, instance, we're going to call our text module and we're going to pass in its dependencies, which is Twilio and phone number. And you can see that at, at this point that we're telling it, this is going to be a text module in the context of a task. This would be as a result, if we passed in a Twilio um, module that was not in the context of task, this would be a compile error. So you, um, because I'm defining this here, it's gonna make sure that I'm passing in the right kind of Twilio module and phone number module, which are going to be those that are also in the context of task. So I'm instantiating my phone numbers with its dependencies. I'm creating my uh, Doobie uh, phone number ins uh, instance. Um, I don't have to say F here because the F is going to come from the transactor that I give to Doobie that I talked about a little bit. And then the Twilio implementation, it takes a configuration object because you have um, API keys, but it returns a Twilio module in the context of F. And this is, our, this is where we're using pure config to get that first dependency, which is our conf object. Um, here is some things that's going to help pure config um, serialize our JSON config object or type safe config object. Um, and then up here, then this is important because this is related to how our logger does the work. 
that logger that we were passing in around our modules and trait and implementations, it doesn't know how to actually use log4j or anything. It doesn't do anything. So we need to provide evidence that um, we know how to log things in the context of task. And uh, log4j will give us one of those because task is of the right type um, by just calling unsafe create. And we just make that evidence um, available implicitly down here. A lot of this in your usual HTTP frameworks will be taken care of by dependency injection. And you can get rid of having to wire these things up manually um, by using dependency injection. But I think it's helpful to know how these things um, go together in the simple cases so that when you do choose to use dependency injection for your much larger apps, you at least have a, an intuition for what's going on behind the scenes. Um, so that's everything that I wanted to show you. All right, thanks again for listening and showing up. This book is 300 pages of what I've just been trying to explain to you in one hour. So if you like any of the ideas, these ideas, there's chapters on basically every section. Um, and it's from this guy here. Um, and if you want to know more about how monads help us do all the things that I've been explaining, uh, Rob Norris's talk here is a good explainer on that. Um, and thanks for showing up. If you have any questions, I'm happy to hear them. <laughs>